Hi, welcome back to the Discipler Group. We're glad that you've joined us. One of the things that's always been important in my ministry, a, a real highlight, has been baptism. I've enjoyed interacting with families, with parents, with youth, and with little children. It's one of the great experiences that we have in sharing God's grace. Recently, 300 of our clergy participated in a day apart in which we focused on baptism and began to experience what it means to renew our baptism. We've been working with you on the theme of baptism because we'd like all of our clergy to help all of our congregations and all of the disciples to renew their baptism and recommit to their membership vows. I hope that you're planning for this in January. This discipler group will talk about baptism. We have with us Ed Phillips. He's an elder in the Memphis Annual Conference and also an associate professor of liturgy and theology at Candler School of Theology. He'll be talking about baptism, be interviewed by one of our own, Larissa Smith Horn, the pastor of Christ United Methodist Church and also the chair of our Order of Elders. We look forward to hearing more from you about your experiences in January and how you're helping to renew your congregation. Again, we're glad that you're here with us. We look forward to continuing to serving together. Dr. Phillips, welcome again to the Baltimore Washington Conference. I am so grateful that I had an opportunity to meet with you as you shared with the clergy uh, at the Bishop's Day Apart. I have some information I'd like to share with you and then to ask a few questions of you if that'll be all right. Yeah. I first would like for you to know that I am a United Methodist person and I've been a United Methodist my entire life. I have been a pastor for a little over 24 years and during this time I've had an opportunity to baptize more than a few number of people. I have been able to put liturgy together. I have been able to preach the word and I'd like to admit that sometimes I'm able to preach the word and do a really good job. Sometimes I'm even great and I must admit there are sometimes I am not so good and the word does not come forth in such a great spectacular way. The first question I'd like to ask of you is what practices do you think the church ought to renew? Several practices come to mind for renewal within the United Methodist Church today. One practice I think we should renew is the practice of forming people before they come to the place of baptism or of having their children baptized if they're having their children baptized as infants. In a process that would be parallel to, in some ways, to the way many churches already do practices of confirmation. This would, um, I would see this as comprehensive of anyone coming into our congregation from outside of the, from another denomination, from another congregation, perhaps even uh, would, it would be appropriate to use this time as a teachable moment in the life of discipleship of that individual. Uh, the baptismal renewal covenant, the baptismal covenant and the baptismal renewal covenant ask some very searching sorts of questions. And I think giving time for persons to explore the meaning of those questions in their lives, not just intellectually, but also experientially and practically in their lives, uh, is, a, is just a good thing for all, for all Christian believers. So that is one thing I would want to renew. Uh, practices of preparation for baptism and, uh, and baptismal renewal. The second th uh, thing that I would want to renew in our churches is for us to think seriously about how we can maximize the actual performance of the sacraments themselves. For too long, Methodist baptisms have passed for dry cleaning, to be cute about it. But there's a serious principle underneath this that I've been concerned about for a long time, as have many persons who, who teach worship and sacraments. If baptism means the things that the Bible says that it means, if we are doing the things that we confess to be doing in baptism, then are the ways we're doing it, the physical ways we're doing it, the, 
the, the amount of water we're using, uh, the, the kinds of gestures we use, do they represent fully, to the best of our ability, what these rights symbolize? Now, I, frankly, I think that there are ways that, that we can perhaps go overboard on this. I mean, I, some churches perhaps could, could go use too much water or require everyone to be immersed always when they're being baptized, and I think that that, that would be going too far. But at the very least, if baptism means the things that the Bible says that it means, that we claim that it means, that I taught about earlier today, if, the, if it means these things, then the ways we do it should allow that to come through. This would mean at the very least, the amount of water we use should be a generous amount of water. We should be lavish with the, our sacraments. We shouldn't be stingy with them. If we lay on hands, it should be a genuine laying on of hands, a, a genuine touching. If we use an anointing of oil, and that's, we have a provision for this in our book of worship, and many pastors I know are, are beginning to use an anointing ritual, then actually use oil. Let people see it. Let them smell it. If, if, if it's an infant, let the people around the infant see it and smell the oil because this will communicate with people at a depth level meaning of the sacrament that a token uh, bare approach uh, will tend to hide. So my advice is be lavish, be generous with our sacraments because of the deepness that they mean. What do our congregations need to know about the meaning of baptism? I spoke a lot about meaning of baptism in my previous response. We modern Christians tend to speak a lot about meaning. We, I think we, we really have become enamored with the concept of experience as the basic categories through which we approach worship, sacraments, religious life in general. Uh, and clearly when we're in church, we're in worship, when we're doing sacraments, we're having experiences. But one of the real questions that uh, is arising in our culture today, in our late modern or postmodern culture today, is um, the nature of reality itself. We live in a world in which we are confronted regularly with virtual realities, realities that are not real but are thoroughly constructed by digital means or otherwise. And I think this cultural phenomenon also uh, becomes implicit in the ways people think about sacraments, whether they're aware of it or not. I mean, I think it really is implicit. I think it's, it's part of the, the, cult, the spirit of the culture in which we live. By approaching sacraments and worship from the category of experience, we're tapping into a good side of that, but there's also a dangerous side of it, and that is it leaves hanging the question of whether or not there is something real and profound and true underneath the, the experiences that we're having. I mean, after all, just because we have an experience doesn't mean it's an experience of reality. So I wanted to back up a little bit and say there are things that baptism clearly and obviously does in the real world regardless of anyone's personal theology of baptism and regardless of anyone's felt meanings of baptism, uh, there are things that baptism does in the real world that must be lifted up. And I'm going to give you just two very, very obvious examples. First of all, baptism initiates someone into the Christian church. It does this by definition. So it's categorical. At whatever age a person is baptized, they are officially initiated, started into a relationship with the institutional body of Christ. And by this, we would represent also their relationship to the, uh, to the body of Christ that is eternal. But it actually takes place in actual time, and it is the first official act of any person as a Christian believer, whether or not they're baptized 
passively as an infant or more actively as a, as a believing adult. It, would, it wouldn't matter. It still is this official moment of, of recognition that now you are a part of this body. It doesn't matter what you feel about that. It doesn't matter if you felt about it one way at one time and have a different feeling about it tomorrow or a year from now. It doesn't change the fact of it. The fact of it exists really in real time. Another thing I want to lift up, because it's so obvious and so often missed, is that when we baptize, we are concretely, directly obeying a commandment of Jesus. Something he issued 2,000 years ago. But when we, today, 2,000 years later, baptize persons in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the triune name of God, we are directly obeying Jesus' concrete commandment to us with the specific example that he himself has given us to do. In a real sense, it's as if time has collapsed, or a better way of putting it, when we do these acts, we are completely connected to this long line of persons going all the way back to Jesus and the first disciples. Because nobody baptizes herself for himself. Someone baptized us. And this line of persons baptizing persons show this concrete community of persons who haven't always been really faithful and haven't always been good Christians and many times have been terrible Christians. But nevertheless, there's a continual witness of persons following the direct commandment of Jesus. Now, when we talk about the meanings of baptism, sometimes we might think that it's up to us to uh, construct the meanings of baptisms, to make up things about it, to make it more attractive or, or have more depth for people in some sort of artificial way. But I would submit we need to get it the other way around. The, fu the fundamental meanings of baptism are so profound. Just in those two examples I gave, that any meanings that we generate have a sure foundation in the commandment and the practice of the first of Jesus and the commandment and the practice of the first disciples to generate a wealth, a depth of meaning that we could never ever think upon our own. As a result of the 2008 General Conference actions, our conference will be launching a membership vows project that will create a new immersion series for local churches. Would you please speak to what it means to renew baptism and membership vows? There were a couple of changes in the 2008 ritual that clarified some points in our United Methodist practice of baptism. One of the changes, and perhaps the one that people uh, have paid the most attention to, actually come from um, the reception into a local congregation which has these lines that most Methodists can recite from memory. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? In 2008, the conference added the significant word witness. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. And I think it's fitting pretty well in Methodist con United Methodist congregations. I've heard it used in several congregations and and I think people appreciate that expansion of clarification on the meaning of participating in the local church. The other changes in the ritual I would argue really are more important although they've gotten less attention. In section 14 of the ritual um, we have this promise. This is on receiving persons into the United Methodist Church. The old language goes like this. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Now the language here really borrows in some ways from the kinds of language we use in marriage rites, in our wedding ritual. Uh, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church Will you honor and keep in sickness and in health? I mean, it has that kind of weight to it, doesn't it? I've sometimes joked with persons uh, who aren't United Methodists and, and said, you know, because Methodists all make promise to be loyal to the United Methodist Church, this means um, we can't really just leave the United Methodist Church. We have to divorce it. And I was being a little flippant, perhaps, in, in saying this, but 
I've intended to take this seriously. I mean, after all, this is a promise, and we need to take our promises seriously when we say them in church, certainly as seriously as we would take any promise. In 2008, however, there was a clarification of the intent behind this. It wasn't some sort of triumphalistic move on the part of the United Methodist Church to say that to be loyal to Christ, you have to be loyal to the United Methodist Church. It was intended to be a way of expressing that we can be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church, and by joining this particular body, the United Methodists, we intend to exercise our loyalty to Christ, which is prior, by our faithfulness to the United Methodist Church and by participating in a local congregation. Because, frankly, that's, that's where the real action is on the ground in local congregations. But there's one other change that's got even less attention that I want to lift up today. In paragraph 14, there are two paragraphs in the old ritual. One says, if there are persons coming into membership in the United Methodist Church from other denominations who have not yet been presented, they may be presented at this time. This comes at the very end of the ritual. Uh, after we've gone through the wonderful blessings over the water and confirmation questions and the renunciation of sin and the profession of faith, all the rest of the baptism and baptismal renewal ritual. In 2008, there was a clarification which basically says this. That paragraph I just read is now deleted. And what is added or clarified here is this paragraph. All persons seeking to become professing members in the United Methodist Church participate in the entire ritual and take all vows, both of the baptismal covenant and of membership. Now what this means is that um, by focusing so much just on the membership vows within the United Methodist Church and in the local congregation, what we were prone to obscure were the fundamental promises that we made or were made around us if we were children at the time of our baptism. Uh, those questions are startling questions, more startling really than supporting the local church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. I would say they actually give depth and content to what it means to faithfully participate and to witness to Christ. Uh, those are the questions such as, uh, such as these. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, oppression, in whatever forms they present themselves? That is an intriguing question. It's a frightening question to me. But that begins to push me to have content to the meaning of a word witness. What does it mean to witness to Jesus Christ? Among other things, it would mean I witness as someone who accepts the freedom and power God has given me to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Um, so, uh, we now, I think, uh, have an opportunity to employ the whole ritual to help develop uh, our denominational mandate to make disciples of Jesus Christ, profound disciples of Jesus Christ that are being powerful witnesses for God in the world. One of the emphasis of the Immersion Series will be the importance of advocating for social justice issues. What is the relationship between baptism, baptismal renewal, and our ministries of social justice? I think I sort of answered that in the previous question a little bit. So let me take this opportunity to be explicit. Um, I think in the church, in the world today, there are all different kinds of attitudes or concepts of social justice. What baptism should help us to do is to ground our understanding and practice of rightness, of justice in the world in 
uh, God's way of justice and in Jesus' vision of the beloved whole community of God. Often we'll hear people clamoring for rights and debating whether or not persons have rights to something like health care, to take a very uh, uh, recent example, and where people are, will be very contentious about such questions. But before Christians would consider what rights anyone would have, we would have to, from the standpoint of baptism, understand what it means for any of us to become purely by merit, without merit, I mean, purely on the, the graciousness of God being adopted into the household of God. So, arguing about whether or not someone has the right to health care for Christians becomes more a point of how do I honor the full dignity and humanity of this person whose rights I may not understand in any given situation. My obligation as a believer in relationship to this person is one of ministry, is one of compassion, is one of imitating our Lord, who of course had a ministry of healing and compassion and care. Rights is just a minimal question. Christians would be pushing for more profound questions, which would include rights, but just as the starting point towards uh, a more holistic vision of, of, of the world. Now, this is what the baptismal renunciation questions push us to think about. This is what the profession of faith pushes us to think about. This is what the blessing over the water pushes us to think about. This is what the action of the Holy Spirit coming to our lives, coming into our lives through baptism, makes us consider as a, as a way of living in the world. If God has lavished upon us these wonderful gifts which we did not deserve, how can we not but be obligated to return to the world that God loves the blessings that we have received? So the connection between baptism and social justice and, and the vision of the whole uh, reign of God is integral. It's not like we have to imagine the, what the connection would be. It's, just, it's there fundamentally in the fabric of what we have received when we have received baptism. Because it's a gift, it will obligate us to return a counter gift. And the counter gift we can return we can't really give to God because God has everything. How do we honor God's give to us? By giving ourselves to others. Uh, baptism just sort of starts us into that way of being in the world if we understand it and practice it fully.